Greetings, you wonderful warriors of the Broken Sword, you. I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick. And we are the Goslings, a digital speakeasy of free thinkers looking to double up on their sound because somebody <laughs> left his phone on once again. I've done it twice. <laughs> you have grace here. <laughs> we are here to strike down the darkness one echo at a time. That's right. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? Good evening. Let's see yeah. who's in the chat. Let's see what's up. Yeah, we've got a pretty active little chat here. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's start at the top. Go all the way up to the top. Let's start here. We have uh, we have a poem, cactus kicker. Yep. They've Brad been, Whitlock. You guys are best friends now. We've noticed. I've noticed. You yeah. Are... Some friendships forming. <laughs> That's what we're here <laughs> for at the Goslings. <laughs> Nick, and, Nick and I were joking. We were like, you know, do we need to cactus? Do we need to light your torch for you? You know. <laughs> He's like, yes, warrior citizens of Zion. I'm Bring holding... forth your torches to me. I hold the Promethean fire that we might burn the heretic. If we need to tie poem to the, the stake, I'm holding the torch. If he floats, Cactus, let me know. Give me the signal. Just give me the signal. Chris Gaps is on. What's up, buddy? Yeah, I think I saw America and Cars in there. American Cars. What's up, baby? Yeah, dude. What's up, amigo? David Bucky. We got Michelle. Is it Michelle Casey? Yeah. Carrie Ryan. We got some new faces in here. Yeah. Tricky. Mm. Tricky subjects in the chat. What's up, buddy? Gabe, Gabe Bello. What's up, Gabe? Good to see you. Uh, was that Chicago 007? And, nice name. Uh, Chicago. And then uh, Ily Allen? It's Elaine. Elaine. Did I say that right? There's a lot of L's Elaine? and capital I's in there. I'm not too sure. Ila Ilin. Are we missing anybody? I think I, we're think I can help think with got... the whole Pam Pam thing. <laughs> hey, Melissa Rice is in the chat. What's hey, up? Melissa, and what's up? Poodle Pearl. Poodle Pearl. Very good. Very nice. good. Uh, Jesse's coming on in just a second. We're going to uh, do our toast. Yeah. Quick uh, shout out to our sponsors. Then we'll jump into the interview. Yep. So uh, hang tight just a second. Let's uh, speak to that. Let's jump into the toast. Absolutely. Can uh, we go ahead and start. Yeah, go ahead and lead. Yep. I All right. You. Take up the broken sword of your father and strike down the darkness. Amen. Yeah. All right. And if you have not subscribed yet, take up the broken sword of your finger and hit that subscribe button. Yeah. Hit the bell. Hit the like. Do the comments. Do all the things. You yeah. know the drill. Helps out the algorithm. Helps dig us out of this YouTube. Helps uh, us. Helps Jesse. Helps whole... get this interview out there to as many people as possible. Yes, absolutely. All right. Sponsors. Sponsors. Kothon Spartan Mug. Drink like a Spartan. Go to yes. CherokoPottery.com. These are handcrafted, handmade by Joel Cherico up in Minnesota, right? Yeah. yeah Minnesota. Yep. He is a master potter. Yep. And these are gorgeous. Everyone's hand painted. They're beautiful. They're durable. Nice Kothon. Yeah. This potter. is allegedly. This is what the. Uh, <laughs> it's a really good Alan Rickman. <laughs> Adam's not here to do it for uh, us, so I had to set nice. it. Yeah. Nice Kothon. Potter. <laughs> The Spartans drank out of these. This is a replica of what the Spartans drank out of. He designed yeah. Joel Jericho designed these in collaboration with Stephen Pressfield, the great Stephen Pressfield yeah. helped in designing these. So go to JerichoPottery.com and check them out. And talk to me about that wiki and hair you got going on. Yes, man. it's my center axis relock hair. Um, <laughs> Joe and I saw John Wick Four, by the way. So Titan movie reference. Yeah, yeah, it's it was solid, solid. And in honor of that. JardaniJovanovic.com. Hair and skincare products made by real men for real men. Or as I like to say, be as sexy as you are deadly. Give 007 a run for his money. Awaken your inner John Wick. Yeah. Give your men, give your better half a reason to doubt that. With JardaniJovanovic.com. Jardani Jovanovic hair and skincare products, as you see before you back here. I am not joking when I say this. Not only do I get compliments on the beard, but I also truly there have been times where I have chosen on days off to take a shower simply because I wanted the smell of the shampoo and the conditioner. Oh, nice. <laughs> I'm actually not yeah, joking okay. about that. I That's so it. stupid, weird that, you know, it's true. So, you know, welcome to my world. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Well, we're going to be in the chat while we play you our, I mean, a fascinating interview with a fascinating woman. Yeah. Jessie's a boater. Yeah. Uh, SRA victim. Uh, she was at a young age. 
Uh, she was groomed by the Illuminati to become the Queen of Darkness, one yeah, of the five. Queen Mother of Darkness, yeah. the harbinger of the Antichrist. Yeah, yeah. S striking stuff, striking yeah. stuff. Uh, if some of it's, if you've heard some of this before, you've probably followed Jesse a while, but she dives into, I think she, she even touches on some some newer things yeah. that have developed as well. And there's a ton of exclusive content yeah. that uh, we have reserved for our beloved patrons. Yeah, so our um, our patrons get uh, prima nocta with these interviews. We um, we air them typically in the next day or two after we are done with them, and then the uh, and they're unedited. Yep. And then the edited version is what you'll see here, which is public for anybody who's not a Patreon member. But uh, we had somebody, I think it was Mike Fisher, the owner of Jordani Jovanovic, who uh, is a big fan of Jesse's, and he said that she went into more stuff in this interview than she has in any other interview that he's seen her in. Yeah, wow. So we were very blessed. Yep. And uh, and Jesse was a lot of fun to be around. She's great. She touches on a lot of heavy stuff. But uh, but she's a solid person, man. We like Jesse a lot, and uh, we are looking forward to having her back at some point. But absolutely. Until then, kick it off, baby. You ready? I'm ready. Let's All do right, it. Let's do this. Without further ado, here is the interview with Jesse Zaboter. Enjoy. Your YouTube feed is crap. Stop wasting your time watching bot-boosted shills and self-appointed gurus cloying for your attention. Instead, join the Goslings interview, live stream, and podcast. The Goslings, a dark-lit digital speakeasy of free thinkers. A super chat of radical truth-seeking wizards who eat trolls for second breakfast. Topics that'll make your mama's hair stand on end. Ideas that'll make your pastor's knees knock. Guests that will illuminate the hidden chambers of your mind. And interviews that strike down the darkness. Welcome to The Goslings. I encourage you to uh, watch. Um, I'll have to send you guys um, my courses that I do. I really get in depth into those things. And, and show how exactly they work, how they operate with it at the community levels, uh, the signs, the symbols you can look for. If on my website, you can go to the coaching session and sign up for land assignment one and two. And in there, I literally tell you how to break down your city symbols to figure out, um, you know, not only the principles that have authority in your area, but also uh, the Masonic orders that are prevalent in your area as well. And you can figure that all out by looking at the welcome signs in your city. Wow. Oh, that's oh, cool. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm down for that. Yeah. I mean, did you send that to us? Yeah. <laughs> and those are free. It's on the kingdom living with Jesse.com. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, so I encourage you to hop in there. The courses, both coaching courses are always free. I'll okay. email you, um, the first course and when the second one comes out i'll email you a copy of that as well but man uh well so this is now like the public version of uh of the interview and uh jesse's a botter we have you with us for anybody who is unfortunately not a patron and has not you know is not <laughs> privy right. to the previous 50 minutes of amazing deep cut stuff that we have talked about um you are an SRA survivor. You are an author. You were a chaplain. Um, you have amazing resources for helping people. You have an amazing ministry. Uh, Jesse, for the uninitiated, um, could you just maybe give us your testimony? Yeah. So uh, the basics of that is, you know, started before um, really any of my abuses started. Um, at age two, uh, you know, I grew up in a family where I thought it was just a regular Christian family. I had my father's side that were Lutheran and, you know, religiously went to church on the holidays and on the weekends when they felt like it. Uh, the rest of the time, I like to joke, the only thing that they religiously did being a high Norwegian family was that they liked to fish and hunt. And um, so we did that, you know, fishing quite religiously. Nice. But um, my mother's side were uh, Catholic, and that really was where, you know, the hidden side of um, 
our family occult line came through both uh, the grandfather side on there and the grandmother side. And, um, you know, really the umbrella religion that was there was the Luciferian Brotherhood. So they were Jesuit Catholic with the guise of, um, you know, as kind of their cover life for the Luciferian Brotherhood. Um, within that, you know, I had family members, uh, both sides that were very high level um, within the system. And in fact, um, my proctor in the system, and that's what we call the individual who um, is involved with our training and, you know, training us how to operate within a certain position in the system. So my proctor was the queen mother of darkness um, with other relatives who were the other four mothers of darkness in that system. Um, I like to talk about, you know, just to give people an idea of what the system looks like. I compare it to a triangle where at the very top you have the five mothers of darkness. Um, the three of those mothers represent Isis or uh, the goddesses. Um, so, you know, you always have the three top over the five. Underneath them, you have the Satanic or Druidic Council. Uh, that goes by other names uh, like the Federation Alliance, the Global Alliance, um, the Galactic Federation. Uh, so those individuals that are on the council, their job is kind of to be like a board for this system. They're going to oversee at the quadrant levels, uh, which is north, south, east, west, both internationally as well as within the U.S., and they're going to make sure that within those their quadrants that they're in charge of overseeing that everything runs like it's supposed to. So you're going to have people in that system who are part of the 13 bloodlines, uh, who are rulers, who are kings, who are presidents, who run universities, who are big businessmen, you know, particularly connected to Bilderberg, um, you know, who are part of the UN groups different things like that. You know, they're going to oversee finances, economy, um, world economic forums, other things like that. So, you know, they'll have their rotations and we call those seat, uh, the councilmen seat seats. Um, within that group, you also have the special chambers or the special councils. Uh, those all go by odd number numbers. So you have like the Council of Five, the Council of Seven, the Council of Nine, um, all the way up to the Council of Twenty-One. Um, for example, the Council of Nine, you know, that's a also we know that one by another name, which would be the Ninth Circle. Mm. So Queen Elizabeth was one of those members on the Council of Nine. And, uh, you know, their group is particularly known for cannibalism. So, um, you know, they classify themselves and will oversee different things um, in different areas. So um, underneath the councilmen, you have the grand high priest or priestesses who will oversee high priests and priestesses who then run the system at a regent level. So within, you know, a quadrant, let's say it's the east quadrant, you'd have many high priests who are, you know, directly in charge of um, the departments that uh, maintain the system's assets. Uh, those departments are um, the Mormons, the Masons, the Kabbalah, the Jesuit Catholic, and the Satanists. So, you know, they're going to see oversee two assets that the system has. The first are the hierarchy children. Those are children that are born into the system that are chosen for positions within the system. Doesn't have to be high level positions. It could be low level, um, as simple as somebody who's going to be the you know secretary at the Catholic Church. Um, so it just means that you're chosen for a position. You're going to be programmed or trained to do that position, and that position is going to keep the system running and operating like it should. Uh, the other uh, asset for the system is what they call the expendable children. I like to clarify that I do not believe any child is expendable. Um, but within that, you know, the um, children are chosen to basically, you know, make the system money. 
Uh, it's going to start with them being used for sexual exploitation. Uh, from that, you know, when they're done with that, uh, they're going to be, people are going to pay money to ritually kill, sacrifice, or um, cannibalize that child. Um, after they've paid more money, then they will pay even more uh, to turn that child into a diamond. Um, that they can keep as a trophy or they can sell it on the black market based on, you know, its value in within the circle of magic. So uh, diamonds, mm. children that are turned into diamonds are used in sexual magic uh, to gain access to different dimensions. Uh, they're also used within the U.S. military for that purpose as well. Um, so then they'll offer more money and sell the remaining ashes of that child to our pharmacia and our food companies as filler. Right. And in that, scripture says, you know, cursed is any man that consumes flesh. So in that, they automatically curse us uh, through pharmacia and our food products uh, because we're consuming flesh but don't even know it. So um, that's just how the enemy operates in that world. So that's the world I was born into. Now, before my training began, the Lord knew and uh, he had our water pipes uh, break in the winter. So we had to move in with one of my father's relatives who was a Christian. And he and his wife began to take me and my mom to church. And I can remember being two years old. You know, I was the only kid in the nursery. And there was this little woman named Lily who was the teacher. And I praise God for Lily every day because she was not like the majority of nursery workers that you will find in churches where they water down the gospel, you know, they make it fun little stories and songs for kids. Lily meant business and she literally <laughs> sat me on her lap, opened up the Bible and began to read to me from the book of John. And I can remember my heart just leaped like I knew it was true. Um, you know, after she read me the first story out of John, um, she said, you know, get ready. Jesus is coming. And I left that day with that message on my heart and began to tell everybody, get ready. Jesus is coming. And that really was the first draw for me was that, you know, every Sunday I went and I got fed with the word. And I loved hearing the word. I loved the Bible songs that she taught me. Now, neither of us knew that, you know, um, that after I came to Christ at age three, that within the next year and a half, my occultic training would begin. Yet um, the Lord knew, and in his wisdom, uh, through that little woman, he gave me uh, every tool that I needed going into that um, occult training, um, you know, which extended beyond just, you know, we're not just talking satanic ritual. Um, you know, that was a bulk of it, but I was learning to operate and run uh, Lucifer's entire system. That was my job, uh, to understand how everything worked and coordinated together and to killing. So, um, you know, in that, in God's irony, uh, he put me into that position then starting at age four and a half. Uh, again, a lot of it was satanic ritual, which, you know, meant that I witnessed, you know, the rape, torture, uh, cannibalization, um, you know, satanic ritual. I witnessed demonic spirits uh, within that system, but it also included military training. Um, my top, uh, one of my top teachers within the system was a Nazi by the name of Michael Karkok. Uh, he was the Ukrainian uh, and Legion of Defense leader for Adolf Hitler. He had come over into the States, um, you know, under different projects, I believe it was Project Paperclip as well as Project Aerodynamic. And his job, um, you know, his job was to train members of the US military how to engage in spiritual warfare and how to operate the spiritual gates. Um, two of his students who then became also teachers of mine within the US military uh, were Colonel Michael Aquino and uh, John Brennan, head of our intelligence units. So, 
you know, in my training, um, they had been trained by Michael Carcock and uh, Aquino had or was trained to run and oversee uh, the programs, projects and experiments uh, that the Brotherhood system was doing in the military um, in the Western quadrants. John Brennan was in charge of the Eastern quadrants. Um, some of the different programs that um, I was privy to were things like the looking glass. Uh, once you graduate that program, and I'll give a, let me give a quick overview of that. So in that program, uh, they're really teaching you the basics of the spiritual gates. Um, when I talk about spiritual gates, I'm talking real gates. These are doorways into the spirit world. Um, you can read through scriptures. Scripture talks about them in many different places. Uh, the first place is in the book of Genesis, where it talks about the floodgates that God created above the earth in the firmament above and the floodgates that were in the uh, firmament below the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, those spiritual gates held water. Um, when the Lord sent the judgment of the flood in Noah's day against the Nephilim, which were the offspring of the fallen angels and uh, women of men um, mm -hmm. who, you know, were sorcerers. They, scripture tells us in Genesis 6 that, you know, these fallen ones taught these women all forms of divination, sorcery, and witchcraft. Mm -hmm. So the Nephilim were descendants, basically, of witches and fallen angels. Um, and, you know, the Lord sent the flood to destroy them. And that's when it says that the floodgates were commanded to release the water that was within them. Now, these floodgates, they operate off of uh, song. So sound, light, um, you know, it just says all of creation, um, you know, sings and tells of the glory of the Lord. Um, in the Psalms, it talks about these gates. King David says, you know, lift up your head, O you gates, lift up your heads, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And again, he says, you know, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. So how do you get from this physical earth into the courts or the gates of heaven? It's through those spiritual gates. And even King David knew that they operated off a song as did King Solomon. So a lot of the, you know, information that the occult passes on generationally in learning how to operate these things comes through uh, the wisdom that God gave King Solomon, uh, which was kept in the annuals and the chronicles of Solomon. And uh, that's the information that they hide from the rest of the world. And uh, they classify it all under Solomonic magic. And um, that was one thing that Michael Carcock was very skilled at, was uh, Solomonic magic and understanding how to work the spiritual gates. So, you know, his big job was to teach the U.S. military to help set up programs uh, where they would be teaching children to do just that. So Looking Glass is the first uh Kind of the first step program in that you know you're going to start to learn to see into the spiritual gates to interact in the spirit world you're going to find out you know how do you access through song um, how do you exactly do that in practice um, in that you see visions um, you know some children that they, they classify two different kinds of remote viewing in there and they're testing to see how do you engage in the spirit world? Uh, we're all physical beings, but we're also spiritual beings. So, you know, the, your classification with remote viewing is um, based on, you know, do you have to have your spirit separate from your physical body to go into the spirit world? Right. Or does your spirit stay with your physical body and you see everything as in a vision? So, you know, that's the type I was where, you know, literally I could be one place, but yet I could be clearly seeing or, you know, sensing in another place as well as though I was in an active dream or in a vision. So, so they test all that. Uh, second, you graduate from there into what they call are the Star Wars programs. Mm -hmm. um, P 
people can look those up further. Originally, they were called Scenante. Um, after that, it got transitioned into the Star Wars program. My specific one was called Star Wars Now. Um, and you can look up uh, a couple of years back, uh, the FBI finally released uh, some of the reports and projects and experiments from there. Of course, they hide that children are involved in these things. Um, but I encourage people read it and watch for key words. One of the key words the US uh, government and military likes to use for children to hide the fact in reports that they're using children is the word potential. So we were called potentials in the program. Mm -hmm. And um, so after you go through Star Wars and in there, you're going to do more. You're going to actually be starting to operate the spiritual gates, opening, closing. Um, you're going to start to travel into the spirit world and you're going to start to learn different forms of spiritual warfare um, within that spirit world. Um, so a lot of different, you know, military bases, different types of training based on which program specifically you're in and where your spiritual gifts lie and how they intend to use you, um, you know, long-term within those programs. So um, from there, you graduate into the Voice of God project, um, which is more end times apocalypse orientated. Uh, with that, we went through specific ritual preps, end time prep things. Um, you know, some of those things we see happening now. Uh, all the knowledge for those programs is based off of information that they've gleaned through the looking glass. So, you know, I basically believe that The Simpsons, um, that that whole show is based off of information from the looking glass programs and the biofeedback reports that they receive from children in those programs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, it's it's really not as much predictive as it is using, you know, um, things that God has given to children to see. You know, God reveals to us his plans, the thoughts, the things that are coming. Uh, some of those things are warnings, which means that, you know, the Lord could relent if we choose a certain path. Other things are, are set in stone, meaning you can't shift it. So there's where, you know, the military has learned to glean this information um, in order to try to manipulate time, to manipulate the things that God has set in stone. So, you know, they've done that for centuries now where um, they've taken all the biofeedback and said, OK, you know, we don't want that event to happen. So what along the line do we need to change to try to get a different outcome or different result? Interestingly enough, um, you know, all of their ability to do that, to manipulate time, um, ends at 2024. Uh, they, not mm. a single individual has been able to see um, really? past 2024. And, you know, I believe that it's because, you know, they can't shift what God has ordained, which is in the book of Revelations. And I believe that, you know, we'll begin to really see the things that God has ordained begin to play out after 2024. Wow. So there's a real lodestone event that is intractable at 2024, and that prevents them from, like a roadblock, prevents them from being able to see and therefore shift. Correct. We were talking about 2024 being sort of a, a hard stop date as far as what people could see with, you know, what some people would call predictive programming, but what really seems more like spiritual reconnaissance. Um, I mean, really, it's the hand of God. Yeah, you know, they can't shift the hand of God. They they're not gods. They want to believe that they are. Um, you know, it goes all the way back to that age old argument between Lucifer and the Lord that the Lucifer wants to be God, mm -hmm. um, you know, and he has his people believing that they are gods. But you know, really, it shows that we only have one sovereign God and they cannot. They can't fight against or contend against the hand of God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's that it's that Dune quote who can go against 
the will of God. You it's can't fight the righteous. Yeah, and it's amazing. Right. And this is something that a lot of Christians really struggle with. They think that they can. Yeah. Like there's something in them that, that actually thinks that they can successfully dethrone mm -hmm. the creator and that somehow they might win. Yeah. I don't understand that. Yeah, I mean, there's the sovereignty of God. It's interesting because in seminary, that's one of, you know, the huge, huge arguments is, you know, what does sovereign entail? Is it just that God, you know, generally he has this roadmap, he sets everything in motion. Yep. And within that roadmap, you have, you know, all the choices or opportunities you want because God does not define how specifically in details. Um, but then there's always the question, does God have specific details for each individual? And, you know, surprisingly, the majority of seminaries and pastors, they, they tend to lean towards that generality, that as long as you're within the roadmap, God's fine with it, you are expressing your free will, which makes him happy and everything's good. But I was the type that you know, I'm not just going to go with the mainstream. So I said, Lord, you know, show me, do you have specifics? Do you care what I eat for breakfast? Do you care about all the little details in my life? And the Lord began to bring me to passages in scripture where it says, you know, that he's written out the days of our life. If he's written it, then, you know, why am I not asking what's, what he's written about me? You know, if he's a, if he's the one who establishes, mm, point. you know, and he, there's verses about the good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do. And as I begin to wrestle more with that, I thought, why, why would I want to go with generalities? Why would I want to map out what I think would be within that will, what I think would be best when mm. God has thoughts about it, about my life? He has things that are so good that I couldn't even imagine. And yeah. what am I missing out on just because I don't want to submit or surrender and say, Lord, what is your will today? You know, do you have the details today? What does it look like? And, you know, he brings out that charge several times against the elders of Israel, against the prophets, against the shepherds. He says, you know, you didn't even ask me for my counsel. We didn't yeah. even, you know, we, how many times do we not even ask him? Yep. So I don't want to be one of those people. I want to ask, I want to know what are his thoughts. Mm -hmm. I want to know, you know, what he has planned. And so far I have not been disappointed in that. <laughs> yeah. You but know? it's like, it's, it's like saying thy will be done on earth <laughs> and down here where I can control some of that. Mm -hmm. And I have the choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as it is in heaven as as you've written for me day by day yeah and i've been in that place of wrestling with god you know that the buts or but if only you know or this is what i want this is what i desire what i need you know i've been in that place of wrestling um but really you know it's nothing in comparison when you come to that place of surrendered obedience where you're saying okay lord i'm i'm trusting you're yeah. telling me, you know, really it's a sacred position because it's like the advisors to a king. We have the Lord God Almighty who is the king over all the heavens and the earth. He invites us to rule and to reign with him, to come into that sacred space of, of being close, being able to hear what he is saying and speaking to us. And as we listen, he talks. He tells us what's on his mind, what's on his heart. And with that, we have to make a choice. Are we going to obey? And, you know, it, it's really about our relationship with the Lord. Um, what are we willing to surrender in order to have that type of relationship? Um, you know, where out of that obedience comes the ruling and the reigning with him, the, the giving of the orders, the giving out of his commands as he dictates it. Powerful stuff coming from someone with your background, Jesse, mm -hmm. um, for, yeah. you know, and everybody wrestles with that on some level. Um, are there any 
books in the Bible or chapters or verses that you would recommend people really focus in on who might be wrestling with this sort of thing in their life? Absolutely. Um, you know, I talk a lot about this on my web, uh, kingdomlivingwithjesse.com. I have two shows that I do weekly, uh, Riding the Storms and Rise Up. Um, in those shows, I go over a lot of specific scriptures. I talk about, you know, what is that authority that we have in Christ and how do we live? How do we really live it out? Um, in that, you know, one of the biggest passages for me was uh, Zechariah 3, where it talks about this scene in heaven. You have uh, Joshua and Zerubbabel, who are high priests during the days of Ezra, Nehemiah. So all those books, mm -hmm. um, you know, they were during Daniel's time. All of those books in scripture are around that same time frame. And so, you know, in Zechariah, it, it talks about how Joshua, the high priest, got called into heaven. And, uh, you know, it shows us the spiritual scene of, of what he was experiencing. And in that, Satan was standing there accusing him, saying, Lord, look at his dirty robes. You yeah. know, why was he accusing him? It was because God had put on Joshua and the other priests' hearts to rebuild a temple for the Lord. And they had petitioned King Darius. Uh, they had gotten the materials that they needed to start the rebuilding of that temple. And Satan, you know, beelines it in there and starts accusing them. They're not clean enough to do this work, Lord. Um, and what does the Lord do? He says, you know, Satan, I rebuke you. And he commands the angels to put clean clothes, clothes and robes on Joshua, the high priest. And, you know, that imagery, while it was taking place at that exact time, you know, where the Lord was anointing Joshua and the other high priest for that work, it also is an image of the work that was to come through Jesus Christ, his son, that he was going to make this priesthood that would last and endure forever, a priesthood that would hear his voice and obey. And in that passage, there's a very specific verse, and really it's a charge for all of us, because scripture tells us that, you know, what did Jesus's death secure for us? Um, in the book of Revelations, it says that he purchased us by his blood to be a kingdom of priests to God. So going back to Zechariah 3 in that passage, what does the Lord say to Joshua? He says, if you will walk in my ways, then I will give you charge over my house and over my courts. And he's not talking about when Joshua dies and goes into heaven you know, he's not talking about the last days or his eternity. He's talking about here on earth. Yep. And that charge, you know, is for each of us that, you know, if we will make that commitment to walk in the Lord's ways, um, we will have charge over his house and his courts. And that's now uh, that we can have that rule, that reign, that authority with him. And that's really what the enemy doesn't want us to have. Uh, the enemy fights for the dominion and the authority um, that was, you know, our God-given right. So um, I talk about a lot of those things and really break them down, um, you know, in the different courses and the different things that I do. I encourage people too, you know, on there I have free coaching sessions with land assignments. Um, and in there I, you know, break down exactly how the system steals our dominion and our authority. Yeah. And once we understand, you know, how the system has stolen it, how the system is operating here on earth, the next step is to learn how do we reclaim it for the kingdom of God? How do we go about tearing down the enemy's strongholds and building up that kingdom, you know, that gives glory to God within our own communities, within our own homes? <clears throat> Why do you think why do you think it is that when people hear your testimony and they hear what you've been through and they hear your description of the system, why is there so much why is it so hard for the Christians to accept the idea of a Luciferian brotherhood? Why the cog cognitive cognitive dissonance? Yeah, we run into that a lot yeah. because yeah. you know everybody's willing to accept this Sunday school thing that you're brought up with, and we all are 
told to believe that there is this, you know, dark, you know, satanic kingdom. But it, when you find somebody who actually comes from it yeah. and lays it out, people don't want to believe that stuff. Yeah, it because and, yeah. and it's like they'll believe a lot of these things to a degree just by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. We all acknowledge that trafficking is a huge problem. Or they believe, yeah, the Jesuits are, you know, some secret cabal that yeah. is, you know, or But then Kabbalah. you get someone who comes out of the experience and says, no, this is all connected. It's being orchestrated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they're like, oh, no, 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 that's too big. It's too, that's, that's, that can't be right. Yeah. I but, mean, if the devil could organize all of this into one system that works, yeah, why wouldn't he? Yeah. You know, I don't know. What, what do you, how, what do you say to those people that just can't really wrap their head around this? I haven't, I haven't had too many who have come to me who said, you know, I just, I just can't believe that. Um, I experienced it more when I was a child trying to come out and tell, uh, you know, where I'd have the pastors that, you know, each week they'd be telling us how real the devil was. They'd be telling us how Satan works. But yet the moment I tried to say, hey, my family's, you know, in that, in that system, my family, you know, worships the devil, um, immediately I would get cut off. Like the most words I ever got out were my family are in the occult, my family worships Satan, and, you know, my family kill babies. That was it. That was all I got out. And most of the time the response was stop lying, get real kid, you know, um, you know, we just, we don't talk about those things. You know, those were the types of responses I would get. I never had a single pastor, teacher, police officer, um, or person I thought might be safe say to me, are you okay? Like, what wow. do you mean your family kills babies? You know, there has to be more to that story. Where is how, this happening? Are you safe? You know, I never got that. How and old I think it's were fair. you? Um, I got out at age 10. Um, okay. The Lord, the Lord literally, you know, I just classify it as a miracle because it doesn't happen. Um, yeah. You know, the system, even though like they still considered me in, um, they can, you know, had end time things that they had trained me for that they expected me to fulfill. Um, the truth was, was that at age 10, I was at a family funeral and as I walked from the, you know, the grave to our car, the Lord literally said to me, I've released you from them. And from that wow. moment on, it was like this massive wedge came down and they lost their power and their control over me. And, um, you know, they knew it. They knew it. Pretty powerful stuff, huh? That was uh, pretty intense, man. Pretty intense stuff. Yeah. Pretty instant, intense stuff. What do you guys think? It looks like the chat's really getting a lot out of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Saw some interesting discussions going on there, guys. <laughs> the Goslings. Uh, Lauren Bauer says, Goslings, don't. Oh, man, I just missed it. What did it say? Don't mess with our blessed bubble. Yeah, that was good. Bubble <laughs> popped. That's we almost we almost need to have like a T-shirt made that just said, you know, burst the bubble with the goslings. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, our intro says, you know, <laughs> topics that, you know, make your mama's hand, hair stand on end and make yeah. your pastor's knees knock. Uh, you know, we want to ask hard questions like that. Talk yeah. about these things. Yeah. Um, I'm not no one else is. No, no one else is. And, you know, I'm not opining on a lot of this stuff. I'm just trying to I just want to hear what the guests have to say. Yeah, we find things that we think have merit and are beneficial. Yeah. And then we provide a platform for those things. Yeah. And uh, I really have never been, to the best of my knowledge, there have never been a time where we have provided a platform to something where we really regretted it. We've had some that were kind of like, eh, I don't know if I'd necessarily do that one again or. You know, or, uh, this didn't go in the direction that I thought it would go. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's going to happen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you can you can kind of pull positivity from any of those. You know, you can you can dig a dime out of that dung heap, you know, no matter how bad it is. But Jesse, man, she is talking about a lot of stuff that no one else is talking about. Yeah. And, um, you know, whether you believe it or not, whether you want to do your own research or not. Um, I mean, I know that 
over 10 years before we had this interview, I had a conversation with a girl that echoes a lot of the things that she's talking about. And this was scary stuff, man. This was 2012. And that, that chick, what her parents were deacons at a church in West Virginia. This was like, wow. this was before all of this, mm. you know, and right here. I mean, that's troubling. Yeah. That's so troubling. I, you know, I get, I get like, it's hard to believe, you know, who is hard for me to believe Micah Turnbow mm. until I started, until we started talking to him. Yeah. And just like Jesse, you go into it, you know, there's a part of you that goes into it very skeptical. Yeah. But then as you start speaking and you start getting more and more details and you start, you know, probing here, probing here, asking little questions here, the story remains consistent. But then the other thing that really kind of sold us, at least with Micah Turnbow and with Jesse as well, is just the the christian objective mm, you mm -hmm. know not, not the selfish by my book objective yeah you know yeah and that really a lot of times that is like the make or break thing at least for us yeah on the channel i'd agree yeah and, and we're having him back i think next month yeah yeah, yeah micah's coming back man yeah. it's gonna be fun yeah he's yeah. such a sweetheart too. yeah i'm looking forward to talking to him yeah. again we really enjoyed him so well but... we got more of uh we got the second half of our interview with jesse zabater coming up in just yeah. a second gonna have it up just a second real quick part d we're gonna do a little shameless self-plugging real fast yes because we're self-published authors so yes here it goes we'll make it quick yeah yeah, Nick and I are uh, a couple of Christian novelists and uh, self-published, and we publish our books on Amazon. Uh, don't worry, we do hire editors and cover artists. We do not, we we do not use AI. <laughs> and anything. we do not use AI. That's right. Um, I wrote the Heavenly Realms series, uh, which is uh, the book that you're seeing the QR code for right there. That's yep. the first one. It's a seven novel series about the wars between the angels. Yep. It's sort of uh, Lord of the Rings meets uh 300 yeah. meets the book of revelation like, yeah kind of yeah. you know yeah yeah michael the archangel oh, it's is awesome awesome and there are tons of battles um it's like military know. angelic warfare yeah yeah it's basically rome Spartan total style. war with yeah. angels oh it's awesome so, <laughs> <laughs> so check it out you might enjoy it uh it's available all of our books are available in audio and uh ebook and well most of them are available in audiobook uh, uh, and narrated by adam burrell and then uh, paperback, which is our preferred method, and then ebook as well. So uh, yeah, you just go to the Amazon page; you'll you'll see them all. And uh, ironically, that's kind of like why we started this channel in the first place. And then it's turned into something way bigger. <laughs> I know. You know? Yes. So it has, but it's fun. You know? Yeah, it's Very... fun. Yeah, and the books are still there. I yeah. just got my edits back on the seventh and final novel, by the way, from Adam awesome. last week. So awesome. the edits are in. The series is done. It's just yep. a matter of approving the edits, getting a cover, and publishing this final yep. book. So don't worry, you still have time. <laughs> Nick, why don't you tell people about Henry? Henry Half Moon. Moon. Henry Half Moon is a paranormal urban fantasy uh, about. Uh, it's basically about a young man's journey of faith uh, that he's forced into uh, as he's called by gods he doesn't even believe in to transverse into the spiritual dimension and fight a race of demon called the Algalim yeah. that are being, uh, their end goal is to usher in the, the beast yeah. uh, at the behest of the Anunnaki. And so uh, Henry has to go and thwart that. Does he? Does he not? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not quite as obvious as you might think, but it is about his journey of faith and it ties in uh, all kinds of uh, elements of the occult, uh, Greek mythology, Sumerian mm -hmm. lore, uh, and of course, uh, Christianity, but it's a, it was fun read. It's all in first person. Henry is a young college student yeah. uh, in Manhattan. So the whole place, the whole thing takes place in Manhattan and, uh, it, it was a lot, it, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Of fun. Check it out. And, uh, if you are a fan of a lot of the sort of weird fringe content that it's we cover fresh. on the Goslings, yep. you will really like Henry Halfman. It is right up that alley. Oh yeah. Um, and I like the side characters in it. Oh yeah. The side characters are a lot of fun. Say they, they are fun. They yeah. are fun. I won't say anything else about it. We've kept you guys long enough. Uh, but wait, in order wait, for nudge, us, nudge, say no more. We have to. We have to at least mention our books so we can write this off on our taxes. <laughs> yes, so that's right. <laughs> yes, thank you. Do, you, do your do your taxes, yeah. folks. Yeah. Uh, they're due day after tomorrow, by the way, on the 18th this year. I don't know if you knew that or not. But, uh, oh, yeah, that's so benevolent of them. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, without further ado, here's the second half of our interview with Jesse Zaboter. Yes. Enjoy. Really? Wow. Yeah. So what did that look like? I mean, you are, you know, you are being groomed to 
basically, if I remember correctly, you're being groomed to be the harbinger of the Antichrist. You are being groomed as, you know, a queen mother of darkness. You are being brought up to be one of the highest in the system. And yet yeah. at age 10, God basically throws a shield down over you, you know, and says no more. What does your life look like in your family going forward? Because you're only 10 years old. Like, I mean, tangibly, what happens in the day to day life after everything that you've been brought up in i mean you know that was my my job was to you know basically do that handoff um up until that point the system you know was a matriarchal system meaning that the mm -hmm. mothers of darkness were the ones that you know were getting the direct orders from satan and were making sure that everything was running the way he wanted it to be run my job was supposed to be to hand off that system to the Antichrist. Um, that did not happen. So, you know, Satan found another way. The Antichrist still, uh, you know, received control, but it did not come from me giving him that control. And in fact, it was the opposite. Um, you know, uh, what happened was that everything that, you know, all the authority that I had within that system was laid at the Lord's feet. Uh, which didn't make the enemy happy. Um, you know, I divorced from him everybody in the system and gave the full control over to Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, the opposite was was done in that situation from what the enemy had wanted all along. Um, you know, although it was a massive miracle that, you know, I was able just to walk away, um, for the most part, people who are in that system who tried to get out you know, really, there was only a few ways to get out. One, you know, you go into hiding and you are on the run your entire life because you're being hunted. Uh, two, you commit suicide because, um, you know, they'll they'll oppress um, and stalk you until you do or yeah. they'll murder suicide you. Yep. Or three, you know, Jesus performs a miracle and, um, you know, you're out. So that's really what the Lord did for me at age 10 was that he really, you know, took me out of that system. And, uh, you know, it didn't mean that I didn't experience spiritual attacks after that. I did. We lived right near a witch's coven, mm -hmm. um, you know, and those witches would taunt me at night, come in, they would attack. Um, you know, the spirits and the physical attacks were relentless where, you know, I'd wake up with scratches all up and down, you know, my face, my chest, my arms. I'd wake up with, you know, we'll just say spirits of people choking me, uh, trying mm -hmm. to drag me out of my bed, drag me out of the house, um, mm -hmm. things like that, you know, just to taunt me. Um, I had to sleep as a kid with the Bible on my chest. Uh, that was the only way that, you know, I could get relief from that. And, um, you know, eventually as I got more and more um, trained in the spiritual warfare on God's side, um, you know, I was able to combat a lot of those attacks. Um, I'm not one that, you know, what the enemy would send me as a kid were a lot of the unclean little chicken demons. Uh, <laughs> I call them that because you just get, every time you get, you don't just get one, you get a whole mass horde of them, you know, so that's why I call them little chicken demons. <laughs> but, um, you know, I would get all those little chicken demons and, you know, but what was I trained for in the system? I was trained to deal with the big principalities. So, you know, I was used to hearing those principalities. I was used to, you know, warring in the enemy's army, uh, fighting within the system itself you know, against different level warlocks, which is who were aligned with those principalities. So to shift from, you know, that type of spiritual warfare where you're on the enemy's side to learning how to deal with those principalities from God's way, um, that's what I had to learn. That's, you know, the tools that I had to learn to use and be firm in. And in that, I really didn't have you know, people who understood my position or the situation I was in. I didn't have individuals that were like, this is, you know, what you need to do for spiritual warfare. Um, what I had was the word of God. I had the Bible. I would open that up every night. I'd be reading that. The Lord himself would show me, 
you know, how to war. Um, he also gave me indirect teachers, um, spiritual leaders, like, you know, out of missionary books. Our church had a great library with lots of missionary stories. Uh, so individuals like Corey Ten Boom, mm -hmm. um, you know, Elizabeth Elliot, that, yep. that was who I learned spiritual warfare from were from these missionaries. And, um, you know, the Lord trained me in those things and, and really called me, you know, into service for him. Uh, with that said, you know, although I didn't have pastors that understood what I was coming out of or the place where I was, um, you know, I would say my pastors really were good, godly men. Um, you know, I had several that really trained me how to live as a Christian. Um, you know, those people became individuals that I looked up to that, you know, several of them, I can remember, you know, our one pastor, um, I had one of my aunts in our family was disabled. And she had been born in the 50s with uh, what we call hydrocephalia, which means she had a massive waterhead. Mm -hmm. And this was before they did shunts. And, you know, back then they weren't expected to live. Yeah. Um, you know, I grew up when she was, they didn't have any way to care for her at home. Uh, you know, they didn't have the in-depth medical means that, you know, we have now. But, um, you know, I grew up with her being in the institutions, um, in the psychiatric wards, and that's where they would put people with disabilities. And I can remember going in there and just the depth of oppression in that place. And, you know, from there, then, you know, eventually the Lord um, around age 10 is when uh, group homes kind of became a big thing. And she got into one that was a Christian one. And through there, she came to the Lord. Uh, they allowed her to, uh, they bring her to church and stuff. And, um, you know, I was used to people not even take, giving her time because, you know, she would take so long to say anything. And uh, I can remember, you know, the pastor of our church, um, he was supposed to be up getting ready to give his sermon, but she got wheeled in and he, he knelt down next to her wheelchair and it was like the world stopped. Um, he didn't care that he had to give a sermon. He didn't care that people were there waiting for him. He wanted to hear, you know, what she had to say. And he gave her the time to say it. Um, later, you know, he helped uh, figure out things that she could spiritually do. Um, she loved to pray. So he and his wife would, they put up a bulletin board next to her bed and they would put up pictures of people in the church so that when she was there having to lay in bed, she could pray for people in the church and they would switch that out every week. Mm. And I can remember, you know, at 10 years old, watching his interactions with her and saying, you know, Lord, I want to love people like that. You know, I want to see people become who they are and, and become all that they can be doing things for your kingdom. And uh, so the Lord used that pastor. And um, ironically, he ended up uh, eventually years later being in another state and was at the seminary that I graduated from. <laughs> so cool. the Lord Very, reconnected wow. us. Yeah. That's wow, neat. That's amazing. So uh, I have so many questions, but I don't want to hog it. I don't no, no, no. Talk Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so through your family, and I actually knew someone who um, who sort of had a very low level similar experience where she grew up in a, her parents were like the deacons in a church in West Virginia. And uh, and she was involved in uh, she was used in a lot of SRA uh, from a very early childhood um, and eventually got out of it and just moved. I think she basically just ran away. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, came to Tennessee and lived with my family for a little while. Um, so through your mom's side of the family, I'm trying to track with the, with the timeline and the sequence of events, you get inducted into this system and you start getting groomed. And then uh, around age 10 is when you start exiting out of this system. Uh, basically jesse how are you alive like because it seems like so many of these people you know if you try to get out of the system especially after being groomed into that kind of high level 
um, it seems like they would want to, you know, silence you. And you're not, you're here, you know? So yep. <laughs> how, how does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, first I want to say, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, the way the system works, all of your training happens within a very short period of time. Really? So by the time a child, you know, of my level is, is trained, you know, we're fully trained to step into our positions at age 10. Wow. So, you know, that's the irony of all this is that, you know, I'm, I'm fully trained. So what happened then was, you know, of course they, the enemy didn't want to let me go. You know, yeah. all the years he fought for me, he, um, you know, I would get repeated, I call them repeated offenses where, you know, I'd get the notes, I'd get the letters, I'd get the reminders, you know, that at a certain age, you need to step into your position, you need to do what we've trained you to do. And, you know, I would, I would like refuse, I would reject, I would renounce, I would be <laughs> burning this stuff. And it's like, no, I don't want it. Finally, I said to the Lord, you know, what do you want me to do about this, Lord? And he said, I want you to take your position. So what was interesting about that was that, you know, in 2018, I took it in prayer. And that's when I laid everything at the Lord's feet and I surrendered it all and, uh, you know, gave it all to him. And, and what that did was it immediately removed all the authority that um, the enemy had given within that position and put it under Jesus's feet. So the enemy lost out when that happened. Um, you know, he lost big time. And, you know, of course, he's not happy about that. He now has lost his top individual. Um, you know, things aren't going to go like he planned for it to go, uh, like he had prepared for years. And, um, you know, it didn't come easy. Uh, you know, there are, have been death threats. There's been the constant, you know, more than direct death threats to myself. They threaten my children. They threaten my family. So in that, as all that's happening, you know, the Lord says to me, you'll give your testimony. And I knew in that, that it wasn't the watered down version that I was used to giving in the church, that the Lord really meant it was time that I would be revealing everything that I knew and that he would open those doors for that to happen. So, you know, really behind it all is the hand of God and God's plan for my life that, you know, the Lord's plan is to bring the system down. His word says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. And how is he doing that? In the book of Revelations, it says that they overcame him, the evil one, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So the Lord is, in fact, using testimonies to tear down the enemy's system. So, you know, the only reason I'm alive is because, you know, God has a plan and I'm walking in that plan. Yeah, man. Amen to that. Um, wow. So a lot of this training that would take place happens at a very early age, maxes out or caps out around nine, ten years old. And yeah. it's pretty intensive. Um, paint the picture for what this looks like on a day to day basis for someone who may never have heard of this sort of thing or has no idea what this looks like. Like, does this take place in the mornings, in the evenings? Do you go to a special school? Do your parents both know about it? You, you know, here for like a few weeks and then all of a sudden you come back. Or yeah. Like, I mean, what does it look like? What are the logistics? How, how would we figure out if something like this was happening right under our noses? Yeah. And are I'll, there I'll some? just say it is happening under people's noses. Um, you know, part of the system, their their biggest uh, rule that they live by is the code of silence. Mm. Uh, that's the first thing that they teach children um, within the system to operate under is that, you know, you don't tell. Um, you have to keep the silence. And if you don't, there are severe consequences, which could mean, you know, your own death. It could mean the death of your loved ones. Um, you know, usually most children who um are entering in they they witness a murder within you know the first week or so of when their training oh, wow. begins because the system you know wants to make sure those kids are not going to tell uh, they also set up safeguards um within the schools within the churches um adults that are going to 
you know, basically make sure that none of the children are tattletaling. They, they always have a way out. Um, one of their most cleverest things is that, you know, many of the military programs uh, that are used um, all align with uh, classic literature. You know, so you've got the Wizard of Oz, you've got Alice in Wonderland, you've got so many other ones, right? So if a kid starts saying things like I was in Wonderland, you know, Follow the white rabbit. Um, they're like, they're like, oh, you know, well, I was just reading that book to the students. You know, we've been studying that this past month. So they always have excuses to hide mm -hmm. um, from parents what's really happening with the children. So, you know, my my training was day and night. It would begin, you know, usually around six every morning and continue through, um, you know, usually till two or three a.m. I would be allowed three hours usually of sleep. Um, you know, that was time that actually was just mine, meaning that, you know, I didn't usually get a lot of warfare in that time. That was my downtime. Um, and you know, besides that, I was going all day, all night. Um, in my family, they would drug uh, my parents. Um, you know, my parents had no idea the depth of things that I was going through. Uh, my mother had been raised in it, but, um, you know, there were certain things that she had experienced and they had passed it off as, you know, it was all in her mind. It was vivid imagination. It was dreams. You know, she was crazy. Um, so she didn't know, you know, that it was real or that it was happening or, you know, beyond that, her family had convinced her that, you know, it was just all in her head, um, you know, and, and then they would, you know, my parents would work during the day, uh, you know, when I started off, um, my proctor was, you know, our caregiver and uh, I actually many times would end up walking to school, um, but the moment we got there, you know, I would be checked uh, present, um, even though I never really attended, like, you know, up until age 10, I, w I there was only a few times I actually sat through a whole day of school. Wow. Um, you know, my training was all occultic. It was all, um, you know, satanic ritual and other things, military training. Uh, some of the schools I was at, you know, I'd get there and then we would either have a it just depended on the day. Um, you know, initially we would have a van that picked us up that took us someplace where then we would access the spiritual gate. Um, but before too long, I understood how to operate the gates and you would have, you know, your dial ins, your dial outs where, you know, you knew the places to go and you would just walk through the spiritual gate to be where you needed to be. Um, you were expected to be timely you know, the occult doesn't do uh, procrastination <laughs> unless yeah. you're dying, um, you know, and on time means that you're, you know, you're like at least 15 minutes early. So that's the time that they operate on. Yep. It's a military um, thing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. When my parents got home, you know, they would uh, be drugged. It would be in our dinner and they would think they went to bed around eight or nine, but really, you know, they were out at six um, you know, along with my siblings and stuff. So, you know, nighttime training was different. Um, you know, that was more in the spiritual realms dealing with, uh, Lucifer. Uh, we would, you know, meet with him or the principalities at times. Uh, that's when he would give the direct, um, you know, downloads of what he wanted to be done. Um, you know, we would talk over any issues or problems that were going on and see how he wanted it dealt with. Uh, so we would directly meet with Lucifer. Um, hmm. With that, again, it's all spiritual. So, you know, some of the training for that, it would start, you know, my proctor would be sitting in the hallway, cross-legged. Um, she would be, you know, have a big uh, mask over her face and, you know, would be saying, do you hear them? Do you hear the spirits calling to you? Tell me what you hear them saying. My job was to repeat back everything that I heard being said uh, because they were testing how well could I hear and see in the spirit. Uh, pretty soon, you know, I figured it was a fun game. I began repeating everything that I heard being said in the spirit. And, uh, you know, that meant in 
you know, even Lucifer's things that he didn't want everybody to be privy to. And, you know, I loved blabbing all that out um, at the most <laughs> inconvenient times with people that really, you know, weren't privy to that type of information. But, you know, I thought everybody should be privy to it. And, but, uh, <laughs> hmm. what yeah, is, so it was different based on where we were, what was going on, what I was specifically being trained for. You know, this, um, I actually, I would love to have you back to talk about how this stuff gets telegraphed in media. Mm. Um, we don't have time to, I, I wanted to talk about true detective and John wick and the ninth gate, but I tell you one thing that it actually really reminds me of is one of my favorite shows fringe, uh, where mm. there's, I mean, what you're talking about with like the children and being able to cross into other dimensions, that is a direct plot thread from that show. And yeah. So yep. I, when you watch these things, you're just like, I think there's some truth to that. You know, there's yeah, there is a lot of it is based off those things. Um, you know, again, they're they're showing, you know, blatantly how they operate. Uh, a lot yeah. of it, you know, for me and my experience, a lot of the media was a way that the system controlled children who uh, went through training in the different programs. Um, many times they take segments from things that really happened to us and those things are put out there and it's just serves as a reminder that we're constantly being watched, that we constantly need right. to keep that code of silence. So it's yeah. almost in a way a threat because, mm -hmm. you know, they're displaying your life, your trauma, your yeah. memories to the world, but it's not you giving it as your testimony. Um, yeah. You know, they're dictating the narrative in that. Um, and they do, you know, um, they do that to torment survivors. Yeah. Well, and it makes sense why they would use children. Uh, because I wonder if there is a, a spiritual aspect to the prepubescent stage of children, you know, from ages two or three, when, you know, object permanence sets in, you start retaining memories you know, and you have, you know, more articulated speech all the way up to 10 years old, you know, right before yeah. you start to hit puberty. It makes sense that, yeah. you know, they would well, use and that. It's, and it's easy to discount what a child says. Right. Write it off right. as imagination or lie or. And to tell to make the, the gaslight the child. Yeah. On that as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, did you have a sense of foreboding when you were communicating with Lucifer and what is that like to talk to that entity? I mean, to, I hate to say it, but for me, it was just something that, you know, was presented as normal because yeah. that was part of the job. You know, he was the main individual that we were under that we had to appease. Um, in some aspects, you know, when you first, when I first met him, um, there's that alluring light, um, I'll, I'll just say light aspect of Lucifer that scripture talks about how he's an angel of light yeah. and he presents himself as that angel of light. And there's a real alluringness to him that, you know, you, I don't know how to explain it any other way than just that he's very alluring. Yeah. And I think that that's why, you know, some of these at the individuals at the highest level they remain in that captivity because of that alluring aspect to him. Um, but as you stay in there longer, you know, you really begin to see his heart, that there isn't anything good in him at all. There isn't any loyalty. There is even for those that, you know, I have known that have served him over 50 years. You know, he did not give a darn about any of them. And in fact, you know, the one time he tells me, you know, his plan, his agenda, it, you know, and it's my job to make sure it happens. Uh, first, he said he was going to kill all the Christians. And then he would, you know, use his human host for his army of fallen angels to, you know, use the spiritual gates to get, um, you know, his army into heaven so he can usurp God's throne. And then mm -hmm. he blatantly said, I will destroy them all. He doesn't care about a single human, not even, no. you know, an ounce. Um, 
If he was displeased with somebody, it didn't matter how many years you served him. It didn't matter how loyal you had been. It didn't even matter if you did absolutely everything he wanted you to perfectly. Um, you know, really, there's a high standard of perfectionism in the occult. Um, you know, and that's part of how I know current day, um, some of these things, some of these people are actors. Um, in my day, these individuals who we now see in political positions were trained. They, the things that they went through to prepare for all of these end time rituals had to be so precise, so meticulous. I mean, even the inaugurations of presidents, they are precise, meticulous. You know, Biden's inauguration He's got the Bible upside down, so it looks like upside down satanic crosses. Mm -hmm. That would have been a no-go in my day. And I had to laugh. I was like, Lucifer, you've killed people for less than that. <laughs> Why? You know, what is this about? I know it's not really Biden, because if it was Lucifer, you know, there would have been punishment, severe punishment. Entropy for a mistake. Yeah. Uh -huh. you know, yeah. Hillary, you know, not the real deal. Um, mm -hmm. you know, she's so trained. She was trained, you know, I watched so many things with her. She was my proctor's favorite person, uh, witnessed her in rituals who we got in there right now, not the real deal. Uh, they don't make mistakes and, you know, we call it posture. You're so trained that it's natural. You never break your posture. You don't break, um, that you know, character that you are playing out. Your cover lives are perfect. That's part of your cover life is that anybody from the outside looking in, they're not going to know that you're brotherhood. They're going to see you as an amazing Christian person who has this fabulous walk with God. They're not going to know. Um, you know, that's part of the cover life. And so, you know, it's interesting to see all that stuff transpiring um, now and yeah, Vicky, Go ahead, Vicky sorry. Joy Anderson. Oh, no, no, yeah. you've echoed uh, what one of our other guests, Vicky Joy Anderson, has talked about with like the high level Satanists, you know, the true Luciferians. Uh, they they are they're pillars. Clothes. Yeah, they, well, they're pillars of the community. They're your pastor. They're, yeah. you know, the, you know, your well, a lot of times they don't even hero. have positions of renown, you know. I mean, the, all the mothers of darkness had to live very humbly. Um, mm. The people that kind of were the foe or the cover mothers were the grand high priestesses, um, like, you know, Lori Cabot Kent, Gloria Vanderbilt, uh, Joan Rivers. They were allowed to, you know, or Joan Collins, they were allowed to frivolously live their life and to, you know, display their wealth. But the real mothers, you, you Satan... You know, the people who serve him at the top really get diddly squat. Um, <laughs> you know, you you get kind raw of like, deal. Right. I mean, it really is a raw deal. <laughs> you don't get anything, you know, <laughs> you don't. I mean, you have unlimited access to everything. Um, anything you want, you can ask for, you get. But really, at the end of the day, in order to get that, you have to live very humbly. You have to live in a way that nobody would recognize who you really are. You're told you'll owe nothing and be happy. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Well, mean, once you're up there, you like realize it. you don't even really own anything. It all is part of the system. Yeah. You know, all of it's through foundations and, all right. you know, other people constantly hold your wealth. Mm -hmm. You have to ask for whatever you want and you may get it. You may not. Usually you have to up the game if you really want it and uh, have to do things quotas of evil you know more so than your daily recommended mm. um, amount that you have to do in order to attain what you want so got to be an overachiever mm -hmm. yep <laughs> yeah and there's just, you know yeah. there's that whole charity balance that you have to do as well Yes, we called them uh, humanitarian efforts. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody has to declare a humanitarian effort. Usually that goes along with your position and the quadrant or the region that you are required uh, to be accountable for. 
uh, within that, you know, really you oversee the evil in that area. So it, your humanitarian efforts are directly connected with your quotas of evil that you are required to perform and that have to be documented. Um, you know, the enemy, Lucifer doesn't go off the merit system. He wants to see the goods. Usually he's going to find a way to exploit those goods um, in some way. Um, yeah. So thus, like the, you know, stuff with the internet, the documentation, pictures. Um, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Everything in your life is, you know, laid bare before Lucifer and his, you know, the principalities, they all know. So. And he hates you anyways, and there's nothing you can do to change it. He, yeah. Um, I had one last question, but I didn't know. I know I, we're pressed on time, so yeah, I didn't want to. We have to live stream in five minutes. Yeah, I know. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. We've been late before. You know, yeah. we're, we're going to be late no, again. You ask your question. Okay. I think I'm good. I think okay. I'm good. Okay. Um, so is there any way for us as surface level Christian laymen to recognize signs of SRA and this sort of thing in our day-to-day -day lives and what to look out for. And as a supplement to that, uh, where can people find your stuff and what you have going on if they suspect and they want help? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I'll say, honestly, uh, there's only really one thing to look for. Um, you know, within that system, we talked about how, you know, you're trained to have perfect posture. And so really perfectionism becomes the only thing that is that clue. Um, you know, these are, you know, I actually did a presentation on this at schools because, you know, they want to think that, you know, children that are in the occult are going to be the kids that, you know, are dressing goth or getting into the dark hmm. stuff. They're journaling dark or, you know, drawing dark artwork. Um, they're having nightmares and, um, you know, PTSD and can't manage or function in life. And you're looking in the wrong direction. You know, these are kids that are trained to function in the highest, most extreme forms of stress and trauma that the enemy can create. Wow. Um, you know, I would have to go through mass amounts of horrific ritual killing, you know, as soon as it was done. I'd have to be, you know, in regular life, pretending like nothing happened and happy, go lucky, smiling, you know, you can show one ounce of anything that mm. anything had been bad. Yeah. Um, so, you know, look for that perfectionism. Who's the child that has it all together, that has the perfect life, you know, good grades, good sports, you know, all of these extra curricular activities. Um, mm -hmm. that's where you're going to be looking. That's where your brotherhood families are. You know, they're the excelling stellar, um, top of your line, top of your class kids who have it all together headed towards that perfect job. Why? Because it's a position that's literally being handed to them on a silver plate. Yeah. Um, you know, they're not having to go through, um, everything that, you know, a child that's not chosen for such a high position goes through. So that's how you look. That's how you differentiate. Um, I encourage you, you know, if you see stuff, definitely, you know, I take reports. I turn it in when I can. Um, not, you know, it's really hard to, um, I'll, I'll just say there really isn't many people who can just respond and look at everything that we're seeing. That's part of what I'm trying to help create is, you know, that awareness where we have people who are looking at communities, who are looking at, you know, these the different brotherhood groups in different areas and looking at how they're operating and understand that enough where they can stop what's really happening to children who are being raised up and trained um, in these brotherhood communities. Uh, so how am I doing that? I'm doing that on my websites, uh, Kingdom Living with Jesse dot and Illuminate the Darkness dot com. Uh, right now with Illuminate, um, that's our main place where, you know, we help to raise funds uh, 
those we call whistleblowers, whether they are champions, that's, you know, people who have been in government positions that are whistleblowing on the satanic and the brotherhood things happening at the government military levels. Uh, we have the veterans and we have survivors. Um, we're different, you know, we don't just help everybody. Um, those that we help are those that, um, you know, are being so oppressed by the system because of their whistleblowing that, you know, they're getting targeted where they can't pay their rent, they can't pay their bills, they can't, you know, go out and get jobs or social security or medical care, um, you know, so we help with some of those select things, you know, we help with car repairs for those individuals, we help with um, food, household items, and medical bills, um, mm, you know, cool. and we're always in need, um, you know, it's, it's long term, the people that we help are those that, you know, the system has kiboshed them has, you know, it's stolen their retirement um, as retaliation or, or, you know, won't give them social security or disability, or they're actively being hunted. You know, they can't just go out and get jobs without getting shot at or, um, you know, putting their life on the line. So those are the people that we help with illuminatethedarkness.com. Um, on there, you can give on the website. You also can mail in uh, to Illuminate the Darkness, uh, P.O. Box 10443, Fargo, North Dakota, 58106. And again, you know, it's monthly, it's ongoing. Um, you know, we have now, we have many elderly uh, survivors that, uh, you know, just aren't able to get the help that they need mm. to continue to survive. So any help we can get is great. Um, you know, kingdom living is all about who are we in Christ? What is our authority? It's about raising you up to know who you are, how the enemy works, how he operates, how you can recognize that within your community. Um, I encourage you to look at the coaching sessions, the land assignment one and two. In there, I really break down, um, help you understand exactly what to look for in your community. And, uh, you know, with that information, how do you then develop prayer strategy, um, develop, you know, intercession uh, strategy that will start to uh, release uh, the power of the Holy Spirit in your area through signs, miracles, and wonders. So I encourage you to look into those things. And those are the best places to find me as well as um, the only online site where I can right now uh, put information where all my intel goes through is on Twitter. Yeah, uh, That's yeah. the only platform that they allow me to have. So I encourage you to sign up for uh, Twitter. I do some on Truth Social as well. That's a newer nice. one. All right. Um, but you can find me at Saboter Jesse on Twitter. And I had a lot of great intel download I was putting out today. So nice. Cool. Jesse Zaboter. Cool. We have so much more that we could talk about. I'm so sorry that we're out of time. This has been awesome. Thank you. This has been a yeah. real honor. Yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to meeting you and talking to you for yeah, I've, it, almost a year, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so this has been a real treat. When Jonathan <laughs> told me that we were actually going to get the interview, I was really just just delighted. Yeah, thank this you. This has been really great. So, and we hope that uh, in the future too, we might ask you back because I know there were some other things uh, that, that we wanted to go over, talk to you about, yeah. and get your get your perspective yeah. on your very unique perspective. Yeah, we. I'd love to. We wanted to talk to you about the affidavits. We want to talk to you about your time as a chaplain, and because we, we're in Middle Tennessee, and I know one of the affidavits yeah. was for something that I, a case that I think was filed here yeah. in this area. I'm not sure. I did. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, we'd love, to, especially as time goes on and those develop more. Um, in any way we can help you with that to get the word out. So, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, Jesse, thank you. This has been awesome. And this is <laughs> that's, Joe. And Joe that's our nephew, nephew, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> he was in the Navy for a little while, so he was okay. pretty jazzed He's about this one, too. Crazy. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. You have a great night. And, uh, you hope too. To be in touch soon. All right. Thanks. Bye. 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 Hey, if you guys have been enjoying this interview and you'd like to hear the rest of it, including some really down and dirty stuff that we're not allowed to say here on YouTube, uh, head over to patreon.com forward slash the goslings. 
we'd love to have your support there and share exclusive content with you. That's right. Keep it cool. And remember, these are interviews that strike down the dark. They do indeed strike down That's the right. darkness. They strike down all the darkness. That's right. Strike it down hard. So hard. So hard. All right. You could be a paid troll. <laughs> you know, Nick and I came up with a genius concept, by the what? way. Like, uh, how awesome would it be if, uh, if like, we'll put you in timeout or maybe we'll, like, hide you from the channel. We'll kick you out of the chat. And you can come back on two conditions. One, you have to behave. You have to be nice to the people around you. Everybody yeah. disagrees. Believe me, none of us agree on everything. Dude, we just had Ron Moorhead, the Sierra Sounds Bigfoot guy. Oh, yeah. On here. And, like, dude's not even a Christian. So, like, believe you will find out next week how much of an echo chamber we are not yeah, around here. But that's exactly right. You still have to behave. So, yeah, you see this room that we're in and this YouTube channel that we're all in? Uh, this is our house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And we invite our guests to this house mm -hmm. and you can come hang and out you, at the and party you get to come hang out. But yeah. at a certain point, I, you know, yeah. Any, any of us would be like, Oh dude, I invited you. Uh, don't treat my guests like that. You yeah. Gotta go. So I think the new, the new way moving forward is, uh, if we boot you from the channel, uh, we can bring you back, but it will cost you uh, a monetary nominal donation, no less than $50. <laughs> right and this is the way and you have to behave so the very next complaint that we get yeah we had a lot of reflecting to do over the easter weekend or <laughs> resurrection sunday weekend or Passover, whatever weekend you want to call it the holiday weekend and um we're feeling refreshed yeah and we're feeling a little uh i don't know a little feisty. Yeah. I tell you, getting away from social media, like Nick and I didn't do any social media during Lent. Yeah. And uh, that was awesome. I have it hated awesome. every second of it ever since I've been back. <laughs> and like, and, I didn't come back to it. Yeah. Nick hasn't come back to it yet. yet. And I, I don't think like, and every day, here's how insidious it is. Here's, here's how social media gets you. Like every day that I am back to it, it hurts a little less. Yeah. So it like it hypnotizes you. Yeah. It yeah. Googly eyes mm -hmm. you. It so bewitches uh, you. It bewitches you. Yeah. What should we do next? Don't poop in the microwave. You know what? Thank no you. truer words have ever been spoken, Cactus. Thank you, Cactus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, too late. Hey, I know. Let's let's put the chat up. Yes. Let's get some, let's get the, some comments on the, the chat story. has been bumping. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the chat has been spitting this hot fire. Go ahead. If you want to say it, yeah, say it now. Put it on the screen. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, Kiro C says, I've been on Facebook for almost a year, and it's been great. Good for you. Yeah. I still do nice. uh, too many uh, YouTube videos, though. No offense. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. You, YouTube is not social media. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'd be a hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, social media. Uh, let's see. Someone also commented... Um, some uh, I can't remember who it was, but they said something to, to the effect of uh, media being like an ancient entity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is, you're right. Yeah, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, media isn't. No, mm -hmm. and saying you know media. It, no surprise that all the darkness is coming at us through media. Uh, that also means social media. Mm -hmm. So let's not go uh, casting stones mm -hmm. if we're still uh, scrolling. Stop scrolling. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. You're telling people to get off social media. Yeah. I, I'm, I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it. You're not making anything better. You're, Next. Not, you're not winning the culture war. No. No. <laughs> no. No. We already lost it. It's lost. It's over. Just stop. Old doomsayer Nick over here. Yeah, well, yeah, it's true. Next so, up for our top segment, Nick Goss going to talk to us a little bit about media and the death of culture. <laughs> Take it away, Nick. This is, and after that, our good news break with Fluffo go. the dog. America is dead. <laughs>
Back to you, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> and now the weather. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what do we got coming up next week? Uh, next week, let's see. This upcoming week, we have two pre-Sunday things that are going to be really awesome. On Thursday, we are live streaming with Austin Trunick, yeah. um, writer of the uh, the Canon Film Guide. And we're going to be doing an interview, a live stream interview, probably around 8 p.m. our time, that is going to be all about Masters of the Universe. Mm -hmm. The movie. The movie Masters of the Universe with Dolph Lundgren and Frank Langella. And, it's an um, 80s movie, right? Yeah. yeah. Canon film? Classic Canon 80s film. Yeah. And, uh, dude, it's going to be so much fun. Yeah, Gabe, fun. you're going to want to make time for this one. Gabe is uh gabe is like the one guy on, on the on planet who gets all of my movie references and uh and appreciates them like most people get them all but they're worn <laughs> out by me but not gabe <laughs> gabe's down for it so yeah uh, we'll, we'll be and that's one we're going to be doing live with austin yeah uh, thursday night 8 p.m uh 8 p.m central standard time thursday mm -hmm. this thursday so yeah uh, Alana says, uh, y'all are fun. We'll check out your other shows. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. It. Yeah. Thank you, Alana. Yeah. We try to have fun. We, we tackle a lot of heavy subjects that we think are beneficial to people. Um, but it's almost like you have to go, you have to delve into the darkness in order to strike it down. But one of the things that we try to do in the interviews and during our live broadcasting of those interviews is we try to come up for air, maintain a level of levity. I guess a, a little bit of Absolutely. levity, you know, and Absolutely. Um, it just like, it just helps you process things a little bit more and, um, and it helps everybody like hang out, you know? So, I mean, gosh, if you just talked about like SRA the whole time, Oh man, you know, it's, it, so, it's so heavy. Yeah. It's so dark. And you know what? And all of our guests get that too. Like Jesse got it. You know, Jesse was really cool. Um, Vicky, Vicky joy. Yep. She's great about that. She mm -hmm. knows how to have fun, mm -hmm. you know? Um, tons of our guests, uh, you know, Derek, Derek is great about it, you know? So anyways, yeah, it's, it's kind of an, a weird, interesting kind of niche thing that we've sort of landed on and it wasn't manufactured. Nick and I started this channel, um, just to talk about our books Yep. and we ended up getting a couple interviews and then we started to do some more interviews yep. and kind of took off from there and here we are. So speaking of fun, where did it go? Oh shoot. And it's been a blessing that it is that way because now not only do we get to interview really interesting people, but we also have you guys here. Uh and with the exception of 3 tonight, uh <laughs> you guys have been awesome. So you're right. Two had to go in the naughty corner. It could have been you 3 know. of the same person with 3 different profiles. <laughs> it may have been. Who yeah. knows? Who knows? Okay, yeah. I got I got I got to give this uh comment a shout out. It's from Kira OC. Uh, should be coming up on this. There we go. Uh, just watched Master and Commander. Oh. It was way cool. More than twice Thanks our numbers. for the recommendation. More than twice our guns. And they will sell their lives dearly. <laughs> that is one of my all-time favorite movies. Oh, so good, yeah. man. Great, yeah. great movie. Thank you, Kira. I believe Jonathan recommended that wisely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We did do like a movie recommend, didn't yeah. we, Kira? I, I think I remember yeah. something about that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great movie. Yeah. Uh, any other movie recommendations? Uh, the Thirteenth Warrior. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Also, possibly. Again, it is the legend. Dune, the old one or the new one? The old one. The old one. Yeah. The old right. one. Yeah, yeah. The old one. The okay. new one. The new one's pretty slick and cool, right? Like, it's it's pretty. I haven't it, seen either. It, it's it's cool. It's well made. It looks like a very well made modern movie. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. But the old one is just, it's like peak weird 80s. Yeah. It's perfect. It, I truly like, you're wrong if you don't like the old dude. <laughs> you're <laughs> you're just wrong. You're objectively <laughs> wrong. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we got to give a shout out to Mike Fisher. Yes, Gives thank you, Mike. Dollar super chat. Yes, encouraging Mike, everybody so to much. be kind and get along. Mike is uh, 
God bless you, buddy. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Mike is the the owner of Giordani Jovanovic uh, hair and skincare products. Uh, we have the display behind us here. He has been a massive supporter of the channel. So if you like what we do, if uh, you want to buy some uh, products for yourself or if you want to buy something for, you know, a, a, the man in your life, your father, your brother, uh, your son, your husband, your boyfriend, your fiance, whatever. A special guy at the office who's maybe a trad, a trad lad, a chad. Trad lad Chad, and you and you're like, man, this is like a Viking dude. He needs some beard oil. Yeah, and uh, John <laughs> very Skincare nice products, very so, nice. But yeah, we uh we had a lot of fun. Um, well, I say we had a lot of fun. We had a very good time with Jesse. Uh, I can't. I, it's probably not right to say we had a lot of fun, but she was really cool, and uh, she talked about some things, and we were talking about it, you know, uh, just behind the scenes here while the interview was running. Mm -hmm. Uh, the stuff she was talking about, it's consistent. It's um, it's odd. Uh, it's scary. It's yes. horrifying. It's so dark, it's hard to believe. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's not happening, though. Well, but then that's, I mean, Joe, I think you were talking about it. You know, our nephew Joe is here. He's with us. And uh, Goshog Lifts. Goshog. On Instagram. Give him a follow for some uh, for some inspirational weightlifting stuff if you, uh, if you feel like you need to start hitting the gym and you're like man i don't know i don't know if i should or not you should totally should but anyways we were talking about it and uh joe kind of made the the salient or point that it was you know it's so weird it's so bizarre it's so unnerving it's hard to imagine it's made up yeah you know yeah yeah too many details uh how do you just yeah Make that up. Oh, and uh, oh, Chris, Chris Caps with the super chat. Five. Thank you, buddy. Strike down the darkness, yes, darkness, sir. darkness. <laughs> You'll hear that echo yet? Darkness. I know darkness, we did get darkness. accused of being an echo chamber, and in the chat, it's like, dude, you have no idea. Dude, you have no idea. You have no idea have the no people. Idea. You know the people that we talk to who are so wildly different, and even like the people who all get along with each other. Like, guaranteed, Derek Gilbert and Gary Wayne. And Ryan Peterson. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you get those three guys in a room, they're going to find something to disagree on. Sure. But they're not going to be, like, rude about it. Right. You know? <laughs> it's not hard. By the way, those those, those yeah. fine gentlemen are coming back. Uh, Derek's coming back in a couple weeks. Yeah, that's followed right. Followed by Gary. Yeah. Yeah, so excited see. about that! Super excited about that. Let me get our schedule up. There. Yes. Uh, so we don't want to we don't want to give away uh, everything uh, for the schedule. But the next oh, we didn't talk about Saturday either. We, Thursday we're doing uh, Austin Trunick, mm -hmm. uh, Masters of the Universe, and then Saturday is April twenty second, Earth Day. Earth Day. What are we doing on Earth Day? We're playing you a special uh, episode. Uh, our record. Well, we recorded an interview with uh, Mark Sargent. Yeah. Uh, the premier flat earther. Yeah. Yeah. Big flat earth guy on YouTube. And we interviewed him for probably what? Two hours, yeah, two and a half yeah, hours, yeah, yeah. something like that. So uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, we've been sitting on that one for a while, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's finally going to get aired. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah. So Thursday is Austin Trunick. We're talking about masters of the universe. And then Saturday is um, uh, Mark Sargent flat earth thing. And then Sunday, were we airing one on Sunday? Yeah, uh, Ron, Ron Moorhead. Yeah, that's right. And then Sunday is Ron Moorhead. I, I have it confused because there are some dates where we're not going to be available. Or we're, we're filling in. Yep. Then we have some episodes that we've recorded, but we haven't been have found a spot to air yet. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But if you uh, are wanting to find out what our schedule is, there is a way to do that. Yes, there is. Yeah. Nick, do you want to pull up the... Uh... If I can find it. <laughs> Yeah, let's pull this up here. Right there. That's how you can find uh, our interview, uh, our guest interview schedule. I yeah. uh, go to patreon.com or just scan the little QR code. And I believe, and we have multiple levels uh, of patronage. We do. We got a lot. Uh, but even at the very lowest level, uh, you can see our upcoming guest schedule. Yeah. So I'd encourage you to do that if you're interested. Uh, there's some other perks as well. Yeah. Uh, but go over there and check it out. We'd love your support. Uh, yeah. We really appreciate it. Uh, we really appreciate those who do support us. Yeah, we do. And I'm going to give them a, a shout out here in a second, but I'm going to leave this up on the screen for a minute. Yeah, I'll talk about uh, yeah. Patreon a little bit. So um, th the reason why we do the Patreon is uh, Nick and I both have day jobs. And uh, and so we have limited time that we can devote to this. 
we would like to be able to do it more. But in the meantime, you can't really rely on ad revenue if you're kind of fighting the beast system through mm -hmm. YouTube. Mm -hmm. It took us forever to get monetized because uh, we kept getting channel strikes. Yep. So the Patreon Illuminati. is like, yeah, we were. Yeah, it's it's one of the reasons why we call it the Illuminati after party. That's it's exactly just like, right. you know, we are we are naughty to the Illuminati. That's right. You know, yeah, it's so. Um, so the Patreon is kind of our our safety net. Yep. It's like our way to um, sort of continue to hopefully dig ourselves out of the out of the hole that we have spent our way into, which wasn't a ton of money, but but we did. I mean, it, it costs money to do this sort of thing. Um, so we're working on doing, you know, getting ourselves out of the hole there. And then, man, hopefully one day if we could like get to, you know, Joe Rogan status, we're like, this is all you do. Dude, this would be amazing to do this all the time. Yeah. Um, but one of the things we tried to do with the Patreon is to give you guys the absolute maximum amount of stuff that we could possibly get away with giving you um, in conjunction with the different levels. So, like, there are, what, five different levels? Five, 10, 20, 50, and 100? Yeah. And uh, you go there, you check it out. You'll see all the different stuff. And we kind of structured it like, okay, if we were paying this much money, what would we want yeah. out of it? So yeah. uh, we think we've we think we've done a pretty good job. Yeah. We got a ton of patrons, and you guys are super yep. trying to give awesome you and... bring you guys the value, right? Trying to give you guys something for it. And yeah. we have there's a lot there's a lot we share uh, even throughout the week. And it's a cool community. And a lot of times That's you guys are part. here in the chat, you know. So like a lot of our patrons are here in the chat every week and it is awesome yeah it's fun so we really fun. enjoy our time with you guys yeah, it's really fun when we don't have trolls and sometimes it's fun when we <laughs> sometimes have trolls. it is fun when we have trolls yeah i like when it gets to that breaking that moment where you're like okay yeah I it's gotta time pull to pull the you know the what is it the uh the ejection uh oh the hatch for yeah the trap door yeah 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 you know but yeah yeah and, hit the eject uh, button <laughs> yeah and and full disclosure because i've had to do that a couple times in the past I am not the banhammer guy. Like, if it were up to me, I would. If it were just me, and like I didn't care about anybody else, I'd leave it up the whole time. I've got a trick, you know? itchy trigger finger. Nick's got more of an itchy trigger yeah. finger, so we kind of balance each other out. We discuss it. We're like, I don't know if we should, you know, when. Eh. And if it hits a certain point, we're like, okay, yeah, this person is being irredeemably rude and distracting and yep. insulting so like yeah okay yeah, yeah we had to do that on christmas day <laughs> on christmas day with a gary wayne interview, yeah and right? it was gary wayne of all people i know you know it's crazy all right i'll take this off uh real Anyways. quick since we were talking about uh the patrons let me uh we want we give our patrons a shout out yes uh at, and i'm gonna start with our highest level patron lisa s yes thank you Thank Thanks, you for your Lisa. very generous support. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Hemingway level patrons, Jody and American Cars. Yeah. Love those guys. Yeah. And then Orwell level patrons. We mm -hmm. got a slew of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have uh, Joshua. We have Lenka, mm -hmm. Lanya, Melissa, Vicky Kelly. And the backbone right here, the backbone of the Goslings. Yeah. Jabber, Charmaine, Jerry, Marsha, Joe, Cheryl, Chris Caps. Karen B, K9 Training, Mama Shaw, Cascadian yeah. Breeze, Gay Bello, Mike Fisher, yeah. Carol, Jamie, Sean, Sonny, Michelle, Charlotte. We love you guys. We're so grateful Thank you. for your support. Thank you. Yeah, it means a lot to us. So, and then, um, what? T-shirt. Let's let's look at the chat real quick. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, we got, we want to put it back on the screen. Yeah. Sorry, we had to sort of step away from the chat. We're a little we... limited on the. Uh, screen space there i know yeah, all right it's see. back up let's see what we got what do yeah. we have uh how long uh, let's see there's oh our, there's our third troll for the night oh there's a third troll yeah. let me just read this real quick how long could you spell uh, yeah oh yeah. here check out uh go up one but um keep going okay yep keep... quinn temple that one right there put this up yeah that's a good one so let's see what we got here. I discovered y'all because of your interviews with Gary Wayne. Oh, cool. Uh, I continued <laughs> to watch because of Ryan Peterson. He's a great guy. Yeah. And Derek Gilbert. I'm sold now with having Jesse on. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, Thanks, thank man. you, Quinn. Yeah. I really appreciate that. And you were here in the beginning also of this interview. So I think, uh, Quinn, you were here before we actually aired the interview. So, yeah. Thank Very you. Cool. Thank really you appreciate that. Sticking it out. You know, and what the trolls don't realize is that... Uh, 
about every month we do the Illuminati after party. Mm -hmm. And it's just me and Jonathan having some fun streaming, mm -hmm. you know, and we do recaps of what happened over the past month. <laughs> and part of one of the segments that we do, You're and mine. we go back and we find some of the nastier, more ridiculous comments, mm -hmm. you know, Troll, of which there's no comments. shortage of. Yeah, so and we and we just uh pick them apart. We shred them. We do a roast. We do a mm -hmm. troll roast. Yeah. On our uh We eat we eat party. trolls for second breakfast. We really do. Yeah. Yeah, we really do. So those aren't these those ain't just words, folks. <laughs> so if you want to leave a nasty comment, go ahead. Be prepared to be shredded. <laughs> yeah. The next time we do uh, yeah. our after party. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, Gabe Gabe's right. The trolls help drive the videos up. <laughs> Uh, the algorithm they really do yeah it, it does help you know it, it's just so funny it's like you guys not understand what you're doing like you're not going to convince anybody that's no. the thing no you're not going to convince no. anybody no you're not you you're know not. and you know like i said you're not going to like score any points for the culture war you're not going to win the culture war right <laughs> by making the nasty comments mm -hmm. uh, on uh you know or even nice comments i mean just comment to have fun yeah, you know, don't comment think to, what you're doing is a ministry by making a comment. Right? Please. Yeah, Co like comment to like God hasn't called you to make comments on YouTube. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> maybe like make comments to make friends. You know, build relationships. You know, connect with people because the thing is the the technology, the internet is so hell bent on dividing everybody and getting you to be best friends with someone 8,000 miles away, but not knowing your neighbor. Yeah. So, okay. So you should still get to know your neighbor. That's more important. But if you're going to be on here, you might as well connect with somebody that like actually can have a positive, meaningful connection, yep. you know? Yep. And agreed. And then go call your mother. So <laughs> right stay in touch with your mom yeah go Dr. call your mom, mom. tell your lover Absolutely. and tell her i said hey say hello to your mother for me <laughs> you ever see that saturday night live skit <laughs> <laughs> say hi to your mother oh, for so me good. hey donkey hey you're looking good donkey okay say hi to your mother for me <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so awesome well marky mark Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. Oh, man. Okay. What time is it? Uh, I don't know. Oh, my gosh. It's creeping up on 8 o'clock. Yeah, it's coming up. On, okay, okay. We got a... We got a jet. We got to get dinner. Yeah, we got to so, get Sorry, sushi. guys. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Turn the chat off. Sorry. Okay. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you for watching our interview with Jesse. Uh, we were very honored to have her on. And I think we're having her back. I just have to get a date nailed down. Yeah. So we're getting close to um, start scheduling again. Yep. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for uh, joining us. We hope you guys have had a good time. Most of our chats are not this uh, contentious, but uh, it was fun nonetheless. <laughs> it was so, fun nonetheless. I Join us Thursday time. night, 8 o'clock Central Time, yeah. for a fun conversation about <laughs> canon films. <laughs> boss uh, we're going to be talking uh, Masters of the Universe yes. uh, with Austin Trunick on Thursday night. Hope you guys join us. Yeah, come join us. It'll be a lot of fun. All right, everyone. Thank you. We hope you guys have a great rest of your week, and we hope to see you Thursday. Until then, I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick. We are the Goslings. Go forth and strike down the darkness.